early 5th century before Christ, Athens and Sparta were the chief city-states in the land we now call Greece. There was no Greek nation at the time. Greek city-states were united only by their language, their gods and religion, their culture, and occasionally by a common danger or mutual interest. Athens, the source of our civilization, was to reach the peak of her political influence and achieve enduring fame as the home of the greatest of Greek artists, scientists and philosophers in the decades that followed the Battle of Marathon. The 5th century BC was the century of what has been called the Miracle of Athens. Rich and powerful, ancient Sparta's strength lay in her military ideals and organization. Sparta had only a small population, but her army was a perfectly disciplined force dedicated to the survival of the city-state and her people. The scanty remains of ancient Sparta reflect little of her renown as a military power or of a city once famous for her athletes, poets and sculptors. It was late summer in 490 BC when the Persians landed at Marathon. The early Greek historian Herodotus noted that the part of Attica closest to Eretria and the most favorable for the Persian cavalry to maneuver in was the plain of Marathon. And so the Persian fleet had sailed on from Eretria to the Bay of Marathon. As soon as the Athenians received news of the Persian landing, they sent an army under the command of Miltiades to oppose the invaders. At the same time, they sent an urgent message to Sparta asking for help. The message was carried by Phithipides, a military courier. Meanwhile, in the plain of Marathon, the Athenians, supported by a small force from Plataea, faced a far larger Persian army, yet the Persians were routed with the loss of 6,400 of their men. The Plataeans, who lost an unknown number of men, buried their dead at the edge of the battlefield. 192 Athenians died in the Battle of Marathon. They were buried close to where they had fallen. A mound was raised over them, and the figure of a grieving warrior erected nearby. Nearly two centuries ago, the English poet Lord Byron described the unchanging features of this historic scene. The mountains look on Marathon, and Marathon looks on the sea. Two and a half thousand years have passed since the Athenian army, superior only in courage and generalship, defeated the Persians at Marathon. The memory of Marathon was stirred in 1896, when the Olympic Games of Antiquity were revived in Athens on the initiative of a Frenchman, Baron Pierre de Coubertin. To those ancient games, in which the longest foot race was 22 stades, less than 4,000 meters, there was now added the marathon foot race. The first marathon race of our day was won by a young Greek shepherd, Spiros Louis. That was in 1896. The modern Olympic Games are now approaching their first centenary. But the games held at ancient Olympia spanned nearly 12 centuries. John Foden has two interests outside his career as an officer in the British Air Force, history and long distance running. These interests led him in 1978 to look into Phidippides' achievement in reaching Sparta on foot the day after he left Athens. A contour map of Greece at his side, Foden began by studying Herodotus' almost contemporary history. Then he took the first of several runs over a number of routes Phidippides might have followed. By 1982, John Foden was convinced he had selected a route that Phidippides might well have taken 25 centuries previously between the cities of Athens and Sparta, 250 kilometers apart. Foden's route follows the Ieraodos, the ancient sacred way, from Athens to Eleusis, site of the Eleusinian mysteries and one of the pagan world's most important religious centers. 
The military way that once led to Corinth has not been fully traced. But a modern road beyond Alephsis winds over the foothills of the steep Gerania mountains and skirts the Gulf of Salamis before crossing the canal that has been cut through the narrow isthmus of Corinth. At nearby Isthmia, festival games were held throughout antiquity. Every two years, athletes from all the Greek city-states would meet there to compete together in the same spirit of peaceful rivalry as prevailed during the period of the sacred games held at Olympia, Nemea, and Delphi. Foden concluded that from the Isthmus, Philippides made for the city of Corinth, dominated by its citadel, and thence ran across the fertile coastal plain where the currant vine and olive and citrus groves abound today. Soon he would have turned south into the low hills rising towards Nemea, scene of one of the fabled 12 labors of Hercules, as well as of ancient games. Less frequented tracks beyond Nemea led on through hilly countryside towards Argive territory. They would have carried the Athenian runner well to the west of the city of Argos itself a neutral state during the Greek wars with Persia. Foden believes Philippides crossed the mountain barrier that separates Argolis from Arcadia at a point between the Lyrkion and Artemision ranges, about 1,200 meters, some 3,600 feet, above sea level. It was in this empty region that the runner met the great god Pan, disguised as a shepherd. The god told Philippides he would stand by the Athenians in the battle to come, if only they would worship him as other Greeks did. Once over the high pass, Philippides' course lay across the high plateau of Arcadia to the city of Tegea. Tegea had many temples then. Among them were shrines dedicated to Apollo and Pan, Laconia, the land of the Spartans, lay just south of Tegea. Soon after entering that friendly territory, Philippides would have begun a long descent into the valley of the Evrotas River, nestling at the foot of the massive Taigetos range of mountains. This was the route to be taken in 1982 by a small team of British Air Force runners. They came to test the truth of Herodotus's account and the feasibility of the route their leader, John Foden, had researched. Before dawn on the 8th of October, 1982, Foden and his four companions stood at the edge of the marketplace of ancient Athens. From here, they set out for Sparta in the footsteps of Philippides. Three of the athletes completed the run, John Shaltons, John Foden, then 56 years old, and John McCarthy. They reached their goal in under 40 hours, finishing at the bronze statue of Leonidas, a monument raised by the Spartans of today to the greatest of the warrior kings of ancient Sparta. And so the stage was set for the holding of the first international Spartathlon race in the autumn of 1983. By the 26th of September, 45 ultra-distance runners from 10 countries, including Greece, had gathered in Athens. The youngest of them was 22, the oldest 54. Most, however, including a woman athlete from England, were between 30 and 45 years of age. I think it'll be tremendously exciting event and the challenge of the course the heat the conditions der grund warum ich hier bei diesem rennen mitmachen wollte war i am thrilled by the idea of taking part in such a fascinating race we live in a little piece of history that most of us that run are familiar with which makes it extra exciting i'm just intrigued with the opportunity to run in the footsteps of such a historical figure as Pheidippides. I think uh, most of us here couldn't resist running the Spartathlon 
because we'd be sharing a course that was run by another human being 2,500 years ago, 25 centuries ago. Αισθάνομαι πολύ περιφανός που θα τρέξω για αυτό τον αγώνα, διότι σαν Σπαρτιάτης και σαν Έλληνας. As a Greek from Sparta, I am proud to be running in the footsteps of Phidippides. I am very attracted by the idea of following the route Phidippides took so long ago. This is the revival of the greatest athletic feat in the history of the world. And I really wanted to be a part of it, a part of the team and of the event. And this is my first visit to Greece, and I want to enjoy the country, which I am definitely doing. Columns, you can see the statues of goddess Athena and Apollo. This building on the right-hand side, it is our uh, university. Well, I feel very nervous, and uh, we just, just uh, it was a challenge of the Spartathlon, and it just seemed to appeal to me, and I like challenges like that. So I just uh, was glad to accept the challenge, and hopefully I might be able to do the same as well. Chosen for its association with the past, the starting point of Spartathlon 83 was the Panathinaikon Stadium in Athens. Built in the 4th century BC, the stadium was rebuilt for the first modern Olympic Games. The time is 6.45 early in the morning of the 30th of September 1983. One woman and 44 men arrive at the stadium to run in this historic race, among them John McCarthy, one of the three airmen who finished last year. The Spartathlon is something new in my life. I shall try to complete the course for the sake of the wonderful memory the race will leave me. I first admired Fidipides when I was a schoolboy. I'm very moved and very lucky to be here in Athens to run in this event. Besides, I like to meet foreigners and make friends in the spirit of friendship and peace. I am a fanatical long-distance runner, so you can imagine how excited I am at the thought of taking part in this spectacular historic event especially as this is the first time it is being held. Greece is the mother of all Mediterranean countries. It's marvelous to be running in a race closely bound up with Greek history. Well, because I have done it once already, I felt that I had to come back and do it again, now that we are hoping it will become a regular event. And I'm as terrified now as I was this time last year. It's a daunting task, but I think I can do it.
is just past nine o'clock in the morning. The race commenced a couple of hours ago. 30-year-old Dusan Mravie from Yugoslavia has been in the lead since the start and has now covered 31 kilometers. The Yugoslav is followed closely by 47-year-old Alan Fairbrother from Britain. Behind Fairbrother comes Yanis Kouros, a 27-year-old Greek marathon and long-distance runner from Arcadia in the Peloponnesus. Other athletes are already widely separated. By the 44th kilometre, Yanis Kouros has gone into first place, overtaking both the Yugoslav and the first of the British runners. Seventy-one kilometers from Athens, Kouros has been running for five hours at an average pace of 14 kilometers an hour. Yanis Kouros crosses the bridge over the Corinth Canal more than two hours ahead of the most optimistic estimate of the race organizers. kilometers beyond the Corinth Canal was the first elimination point. If any competitor had not reached this point by 6 p.m., he would have had to withdraw. There were four other such points along the course, the last being at Sparta itself. A runner had to arrive there within 36 hours to qualify as a finalist. Water holes, such as this one, were set up along the entire route, roughly one every five kilometers. Here an athlete could obtain water, for sponging down as well as for drinking, light refreshments and first aid. Kouros has stripped down to the lightest improvised garment on which his race number can be displayed. Three kilometers behind the Greek athlete comes the Yugoslav Mravlier, doggedly maintaining his challenge a cooling sponge tucked into the top of his vest. Twenty years older than the leading runner, the Englishman Fairbrother lies third, a few kilometers to the rear. Fairbrother is closely followed by the West German Alphonse Everts. There will be no variation in the final order of the first four runners, but the distances that separate them will grow. In the late afternoon, the Austrian, Paterman, and his English co-runner, Patrick Mackey, are about 30 kilometers behind the leading athlete. Pacing one another from start to finish, they pass by the ruins of ancient Corinth as the sun goes down. The strain is beginning to show on Dushan Mravlier's face as he follows Kouros along the valley road, leading uphill towards ancient Nemea. This country is celebrated still for its red wines. As night falls, Kouros runs past the tall columns of the temple of Nemean Zeus. Acre Nemea is another elimination point where official timekeepers check the progress of each runner. 
Kouros and his immediate rivals have plenty of time in hand. Nemea, Malandrenium, Lyrkia, Caparelli, up the steep, stony, zigzag goat track to the summit of the mountain barrier, down the other steep side to Sangas in Arcadia, all in darkness, for there is no moon this side of midnight to light the way for the leading runners. From Sangas to Nestani, 25 kilometers to the south is Tegea. Just a few minutes before midnight, Kouros enters Tegea, seven hours in advance of the anticipated time. The Tegeans have been advised of his amazingly early approach and turn out to welcome him, proud of this young Greek runner who seems set to win this extraordinary race. Dusham Ravlier the Yugoslav follows, nearly two hours behind. Yanis Kouros keeps up his almost mechanical rhythm, not yielding any distance to his closest rival. Dusham Ravlier presses on, but he cannot close the gap. has gone ahead to Sparta. The winner is approaching, many hours before he is expected. At a quarter to five in the morning, Kouros is only one kilometer from the statue of Leonidas. Leading townspeople, race officials, and a few citizens of Sparta are waiting at this early hour to greet this seemingly tireless Greek runner, a 20th century Philippides. Once again, a Greek wins a race, reviving an event in ancient history on the first occasion it is run. Spurus Lewis did so in 1896 when he won the first marathon. <laughs> Winner of Sparta Athlon 83, Yanis Kouros arrives in Sparta the day after he left Athens. Did Pivipidis finish this 250 kilometer run in just under 22 hours? averaging more than 11 kilometers or seven miles an hour over such a testing route. Two Spartan girls offer the victor water, symbol of Greek hospitality, from a two-handled cup, faithful copy of a terracotta cup in the Museum of Sparta. The mayor of Sparta places a wreath of olive sprigs on Kouros' head, a hallowed tradition of athletic contests in antiquity. Soon after dawn on Saturday, at the start of the second day of the race, the sun illuminates the bare slopes of Mount Taigetus. Dushan Mravlier is now within a few kilometers of Sparta. Half an hour later, at 7.40 in the morning, Mravlier runs up to the finishing point, nearly three hours after Kouros. He is received with the same warmth and enthusiasm as the winner. Englishman Fairbrother can afford to walk now. Three hours behind Mravlier, he is one hour ahead of his closest competitor, Alphonse Everts. His third place is hardly in doubt. Everts of West Germany is striding out for his goal eight kilometers away. By half past ten in the morning, the town band is on parade. It had not been expecting to greet even the winner till after midday.
an hour later, the West German runner, Alphonse Everts, becomes the fourth finalist. Within less than 10 minutes, Mike Newton of England is also receiving the tributes due to him as a finalist. Among the moving tributes paid by leading citizens of Sparta during the awards ceremony was one that called for a return to the Olympic ideal. We must turn back to the origins of the Olympic ideal. Athletics exercise the body, cultivate the mind, and draw nations together in the common struggle for freedom, democracy, justice, and peace. These ideals are well served by Spartathlon athletes, to whom we offer our heartfelt thanks at the same time as wishing that each one of them may become a Fizipidis, carrying the message of Spartathlon to the ends of the earth. Yanis Kouros from Greece. Dusham Ravlier from Yugoslavia. Alan Fairbrother from Great Britain. Alphonse Everts from West Germany. Mike Newton from Great Britain. Bertil Jarlaka from Sweden. Noel Rogier from Belgium, Gérard Stenger from France, Eleanor Adams from England, the only woman in the race, a schoolteacher, 35 years old and the mother of three children, Edgar Paterman, Austria, 54 years old, and Patrick Mackey from Great Britain, just half his age, who finished equal tenth, Alan Tompkinson from Great Britain, Robert Meadowcroft from Great Britain, Brian Mist from New Zealand, Fernand Tonneau from Belgium. The winner and the first and second runner-up of Spartathlon 83 received replicas of ancient vases, each filled with Spartan earth. Never before in its long history has Sparta offered its earth to foreigners. To have done so, would have signified submission and subjection. Today, however, this gesture symbolizes love and friendship. And in making it, we wish and hope that your splendid idea of initiating this foot race may take root in this same soil and may soon take its place among the events of the Olympic Games.